right? Cain and Abel. And we're going to read Genesis chapter 4, 1 to 16. Genesis 4, 1 to 16. <clears throat> and we'll be spending at least three weeks upon this. It's a very rich text. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth? which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tellest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from the face shall I be hid, thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and to vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. In chapter 4, the inspired narrator, that is Moses, <coughs> turns his attention from the origin of sin in, in humanity to its lasting effect upon mankind. The focus of chapter 3 was to note how the first man, the federal head of mankind, fell into sin and brought guilt, moral depravity, and spiritual and physical death to the human race. In chapter 4, we see the consequences of the fall on the first social institution, the family. Now, the purpose of this narrative, as all biblical history, is not to write a typical history of mankind. As a modern historian would record events, that's not the purpose but to write the history of redemption. Starting from the fall of Adam and the promise of a redeemer, made ironically to the devil in the presence of Adam and Eve, Moses goes on to set forth the crucial elements of human history that result in the godly line and the victory of Jesus Christ, as well as the wicked line that opposes God's rule. It is an exceptionally rich section of Scripture. Now, regarding this portion of God's Word, there are a number of introductory matters that we need to consider that merit our attention. First, the story of Cain and Abel follows the story of the fall chronologically, structurally, and logically. After the creation account and the sin of Adam, we are shown how the curse of sin affects daily life. Man's rejection of God's command 
and fall leads to enmity, not simply between man and God, that's to be expected, but also between man and man. <clears throat> Eve's lack of faith in Jehovah's law word led her to rebel against his instructions. Similarly, Cain's lack of faith in God's word, God's instructions regarding the acceptable means of approaching him in worship, leads not only to rebellion in the form of human autonomy and worship, but also the persecution and murder of the godly seed. And I want to add, a, we see here the first false view of redemption. The twin pillars of the Reformation are, how do we approach God in worship, biblical worship, and how are we saved? How are we redeemed? Cain denies both, and he teaches salvation through the work of his own hands, as we'll see in a moment. The godless quest to be liberated from the authority of the highest lawgiver leads to horrible licentiousness. Also in the uh, area of mutual human relationships. Okay, and you know the Ten Commandments. The, the first four deal with our relationship to God. The fifth kind of is, deals with both, but primarily with uh, parents and authorities. And then the second table of the law, of course, deals with our relationship with man. When the relationship with God is perverted, the relationship with man is perverted. <clears throat> the wickedness of fallen humanity is readily observed in comparing unfallen Eve's sin to fallen Cain. Now remember, Eve had to be persuaded to sin by the subtle deception of Satan. She had to be tricked. She had to be tempted. She had to be conned by the devil. Cain simply followed the inclinations of his evil heart. His fallen nature. After Cain became angry, and God kindly appealed to him to do the right thing and avoid falling into an even greater sin, Cain stubbornly disregarded this appeal and deliberately sinned against this direct revelation from God. Now remember, the first family, they're part of the visible church at this time, and God appeals to Cain, do the right thing. Yeah, you made a mistake. You sinned. You offered false worship. You approached me through the work of your own hands instead of the blood of a sacrifice. And now you're angry. You're angry at your brother. Do the right thing before it's too late. Moreover, <clears throat> when God pronounced judgment upon Adam and Eve, they listened to their sentence with silent resignation. They didn't rebel against it. But Cain bitterly protested against God that his judgment was unjust and far too harsh. The history immediately after the fall reveals that mankind is totally depraved. That sin is firmly, firmly entrenched in the human family. And that man's history will be one of conflict and bloodshed. And here's what Derek Hidner writes. This is excellent. Quote, sin is shown with its own growth cycle, as in James 1.15. And its 7b, it is personified in an almost Pauline formulation. See Romans 7, 8 and following. Many details emphasize the depth of Cain's crime, and therefore of the fall. The context is worship, the victim, a brother. And while Eve had been talked into her sin... Cain will not even have God talk him out of it, nor will he confess to it, nor yet accept his punishment. End of quote. So we have here an exhibition of depravity. The effect of the fall. Now the portion of the story is similar to the fall narrative with a number of closely parallel scenes. 
The central scene in each case is a terse description of the sin, which contrasts strikingly with the long dialogues before and afterwards. The following scene in each case, where God investigates and condemns the sin, is remarkably similar. Where is Abel your brother? 4-9. Where are you? 3-9. Now, of course, God knows, but he's doing this for the sake of man, to expose their guilt, to make them knowledgeable of their sin and their guilt. What have you done? You are cursed from the land. You are more cursed than all domesticated animals. The land is cursed because of you. Both stories conclude with the transgressors leaving the presence of God and going to live east of Eden, 416 and 324. Now second, and this is obvious to you, but it needs to be said, contrary to modernists, that is Christian liberals, skeptics, and neo-evangelicals, Genesis 4 is intended as a literal historical message. Not myth, not legend, or a story made up or redacted by priests at a later date. This is real history. This actually happened. If you were there, you would have seen these things occur. Jesus himself accepted the story at face value and named Abel as the first persecuted and murdered saint. Matthew 23, 35, and Luke 11, 50 to 51. Who's the first saint killed by persecution in human history? Abel. The author of Hebrews refers to Abel's blood sacrifice as a great act of faith, Hebrews 11, 4. John mentions Cain as a supreme example of wickedness and hatred contrary to love, 1 John 3, 11 to 12. John's talking about the need of saints to love one another. It shows that you're a true Christian. By the way, if you want to see an example of what love is not, look at Cain. Jude speaks of wicked men who reject authority as people who have followed in the way of Cain. Verse 11. Cain becomes a paradigm of evil throughout history. Now the assumption throughout the whole Bible is that all Scripture... Is God breathed? It is breathed out by God or inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16 And thus is infallible and totally reliable. Those who reject the testimony of Christ and the apostles on this matter are followers of Cain, not the Redeemer. Now why do I bring this up? I bring this up because you read modern commentaries by people who are supposed to be evangelical and they've, a lot of them buy into the JDE and P theory and modernist theories about the early chapters of Genesis because they want to be intellectually accepted by the world. And we say, reject all that out of hand. Third, <clears throat> this narrative is rich in doctrine and covers a number of important topics. <clears throat> it shows the antithesis between the godly believing line and the wicked unbelieving line. This is a major theme throughout the Bible. For the true church will be persecuted throughout history. There's a battle going on between the devil and his followers and God and his followers. It's very prominent in the Old Testament. Behind this antithesis are two completely different plans for dominion. In God's plan, we have election, faith, the line that will lead to Jesus Christ in victory, as well as those who are obedient, who are part of the visible church. The devil's plan is founded upon human autonomy, situation ethics, rebellion against God, faith in mankind, and salvation through self-effort. Cain did what was right in his own eyes. Cain approached God on his own terms. He said, I'm not going to offer a blood sacrifice. I'm not fallen. I'm not guilty. I'm a good person. God will accept my fruit of the ground. God will accept my work, my labors. He's the first secular humanist in a sense. Thus, <coughs> this scene sets the pattern of Old Testament redemptive history. 
In addition, it reveals the true approach to God versus the false humanistic approach. Abel, the author of Hebrews says, 11.4, had true faith and thus approached Jehovah through a blood sacrifice, which of course symbolized the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. So we have your great themes, the proper method of redemption, the proper way to approach God and worship, the two lines, the ungodly line and the godly line, the battle between God and the devil. All of it is found in these verses. Cain offered the fruit of the ground of the work of his own hands. Thus, in the very beginning of redemptive history, the two antithetical views of salvation are set before us. Salvation through Jesus Christ or salvation through works. Yeah, it's all here. And we'll see it in detail. <coughs> it also teaches about true and false worship, and that faith was exhibited in an act of worship. Abel had faith in God's prior revelation and thus offered a burnt offering. And we're going to look at that in detail. How do we know that he had faith in a prior revelation where faith has to be in something that God has spoken? Faith is not arbitrary. It is not based on what we think is right. <clears throat> He had an understanding of sola scriptura or the principle that we are not to add or detract from what God has commanded. If you want to approach God, you have to do it his way. Precisely his way and only his way. If you make up your own worship or you make up your own way of salvation, you're lost. Cain followed that satanic philosophy <clears throat> that we could be a law unto ourselves. He offered the fruit of the ground because he thought it was a good idea. He is the first innovator in worship in history. And then we're going to look at that in detail. Now, there, there is a possibility, uh, there's a remote possibility that God had revealed to them a blood offering, the burnt offering, and that God had revealed unto them a thank offering, offering the fruit of like a grain offering or a cereal offering, which we find in Leviticus chapter 3. That's, that's a possibility. However, we're going to see that the blood offerings are always first in their redemption through Jesus Christ. The cereal or grain offering, the thank offering, is a consecration offering that is related to sanctification. And remember, who offered the sacrifice first? Cain did. Well, let's look at the narrator's introduction to the story. Oh, and just fourth, uh, just a quick scholarly mention, the chiastic structure of the clauses is deliberate and once again is part of beautiful Hebrew poetry storytelling. Cain and Abel, 1 to 2a, Abel and Cain, 2b, Cain and Abel, 3 to 4. The names are inverted. It's amazing. When you look at, <coughs> if you look at the Old Testament, if you know Hebrew really well, I don't, but if you know Hebrew really well and you read it in the Hebrew and you look at the structure, you say, whoever wrote this was divinely inspired and it's brilliant storytelling. Hebrew is the ultimate language of storytelling. Greek is the ultimate language of theology in exact uh, writing. So God chose two languages that are appropriate for his revelation. Well, let's look at the narrator's introduction to the story. Verses 1 and 2 sets the scene for the drama that follows. <coughs> Ties the story to the preceding narrative and constitute the opening of the genealogy of Adam. Okay, there will be a, a start of a genealogy, and then if, a little later it will continue. Now, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now the expression, Adam knew his wife Eve, is a common Semitic way to say that Adam had sexual relations with his wife. <coughs> Although the team Hebrew term no, yeda, is a broad term, 
Similar to our English word, it can refer to intellectual knowledge, it can refer to uh, intimacy in a relationship and so forth. In this context, it is a euphemism for sexual intercourse. One could paraphrase it, Adam was intimate with his wife Eve. The phrase with, his wife, uh, with Eve, his wife, emphasizes that their sexual relationship was lawful and blessed. Okay, this, was, this is what God wanted them to do. This was part of the dominion mandate, was to produce children. And this is what they're doing. They're obeying God. Now, interestingly, <clears throat> although the word no is used in Scripture rarely of illicit relationships, uh, homosexual relations in Genesis 19.5, however, by the way, the word is spoken by the homosexuals, and incest, Genesis 38.26, Usually, different terms such as go into, Genesis 16, 2, 4, 38, or lie with, 39, 7, are preferred for illicit relationships. These expressions focus on the fact that in illicit relationships built on lust, there is not a true reciprocal intimacy that's reserved for marriage. The word no when used of lawful marital intimacy implies a deeper, more intimate relationship than a mere physical interaction. Consequently, the NIV, the NIV's paraphrase, Adam lay with Eve, is most unfortunate. Okay, they're, they're paraphrasing, they're, they're taking the intent of the author under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and they're messing it up by trying to make it more clear. And what they're doing is, is they're not making it more clear, they're changing the intended meaning that God wants us to have. That's, the end. That's why we should never ever use the NIV and we should never ever use paraphrases. The point of telling us that Adam knew his wife Eve is to tell us of the conception and birth of Cain. <clears throat> Presumably Adam and Eve's firstborn son. This is the firstborn. The name Cain, Cain, has an uncertain etymology. It is likely that Cain is based on a popular or po poetic etymology due to its similarity and sound to the verb acquire, which is Cana, Cana, used by Eve. Some scholars believe it is connected to the Aramaic word Kenaya or Kene, Kenea or Kene, and the Arabic word Kainam, meaning metalsmith or worker in metal. <coughs> now they say that because Cain's direct descendant, Tubal Cain, is described as the father of all metallurgists in Genesis 4.22. Due to the context, the name is likely connected to Eve's acquiring a man from God. She's happy. God has blessed me. God has given me a son. I have acquired it from God. After the birth of her son, Eve joyfully exclaims, I have acquired a man from the Lord, verse, 16, uh, verse 1b. Uh, Eve acknowledges that children are God's gifts. And as we'll see in a while, there's clear evidence that Adam and Eve were, were believers and they were saved. Very clear evidence of that. <clears throat> she took comfort in the fact that Jehovah had enabled her to bear a son. The dominion mandate will be fulfilled in spite of the fall. Though Eve bore him with the sorrows that were the consequences of sin, yet she did not lose the sense of the mercy in her pains. Comforts, though alloy, are more than we deserve, and therefore our complaints must not drown out our thanksgivings. Keep in mind, she had just gone through severe pain in childbirth as God had warned would happen due to her sin. <clears throat> Given the promise of a coming Redeemer through her seed and the fact that this was Eve's firstborn son, it could be very well uh, that Eve regarded Cain as the heir to the promise, as Leopold observes. Now remember, God had just made this promise recently and here's a son through your seed. Here's Cain. 
Leopold writes this. The experience of birth with his travail having been successfully terminated, she describes what she acquired to Jehovah's help. <coughs> and some translations have from, with the help of the Lord. In this phrase lie both thankfulness and praise. Thankfulness at the deliverance from pain and danger. Praise that Jehovah is manifesting his grace and faithfulness in giving a son. So the use of the name Yahweh should be observed. Apparently, then since the name stresses his gracious faithfulness, Eve praises God that he who promised victory to the seed of the woman actually lets the seed of the woman be born. <clears throat> so God promises and then Eve's looking at this as possible fulfillment. Now, nothing indicates whether Eve did or did not anticipate that this very seed, Cain, should personally crush the serpent's head. But in any case, she had a token of Yahweh's fidelity. Now, Eve's words of praise and thanksgiving indicate that although she had been deceived by Satan and sinned against God, she had realized her great error, <coughs> repented, and placed her faith in God's word of promise. With this in mind, her words of joy should be viewed as a confession of her faith. Now, due to the Hebrew text, which is liable to different translations, there is another interpretation of this verse that is possible. We're just going to note it briefly. The Hebrew here could be translated, I have gained a man, the Lord. Okay, I have gained a man, the Lord. This translation, by the way, was preferred in the ancient church and the Middle Ages. Luther preferred it and then later on uh, rejected it. <clears throat> According to this translation, Eve viewed Cain as the promised one to come, the God-man. The problem with this view is that it reads the much later developed theology of the coming Messiah back into Eve's thinking. While Genesis 3.15 is clearly a prophecy about Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, <coughs> who is clearly God of very God, he's Jehovah, the passage itself gives no hint that the seed of the woman was to be divine, that the Messiah who was to be fully man and fully God was revealed at a much later time in redemptive history. Although we do not uh, prefer this translation or interpretation, we do believe that in some sense Eve saw the birth of Cain as leading to the fulfillment of the maternal promise. Tragically, Cain, Cain failed miserably to live, live up to Eve's hopes. So, just that's, that's you're going to hear that in sermons. You're going to, if you look at commentaries, this is one of the views you're going to see, because that is a possible translation of the Hebrew. In verse 2, we read about Abel, Cain's brother. She bore again. This time, his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground, verse 2. Now, because no mention here is made <coughs> of Adam having sexual relations with Eve, a number of scholars believe that Cain and Abel were twins. You'll see that. Quite a few believe they were twins. This view is unlikely given the fact that, number one, Scripture in other places, takes note of the birth of twins. They seem to be significant. Two, given the context and the brevity of the account, the omission of such a reference to the conception of Abel is not significant. It could be expected. And three, the twins' argument is based on silence and thus, although interesting, cannot be proved. It's possible, but I don't think it's likely. That Cain and Abel were brothers is enough information for the point of the story. But you'll see the law. A lot, of, a lot of commentators believe they were twins. The word Abel means vanity, breath, or futility. So it's kind of a popular name. People, maybe they don't know what it means. Vanity, breath, or futility in Hebrew. And maybe that this name was in a sense prophetic and alluded to the fact, the tragic fact, that his life will be cut short before he can get married and raise a family. His name calls to mind, of course, Psalm 144.4. Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Oh, 
Oh, by the way, some believe that this name is not prophetic, but rather reflects Eve's disillusionment with life after the fall. Life in the fallen world was marred by sin and seemed rather empty or futile compared with life in the garden. That's, that's another interpretation. I don't think it's very good, but it's possible. Since a name meaning vanity or breath seems somewhat depressing, <coughs> some think the name comes from the Sumerian Ibil or Ibila, or the Akkadian Av, meaning sun. That's a distinct possibility. Now we, uh, contrary to many older commentators, I don't believe that Adam and Eve were speaking Hebrew. <laughs> I believe Hebrew came later, but that's a possibility. That sun. In 2b, the different <clears throat> occupations of the two brothers are noted to help explain the first scene of the story, which regards their offering. <clears throat> Abel was a keeper of sheep. And the Hebrew word here for sheep refers to small livestock and can refer to sheep and goats. Cain tilled the ground. He did exactly what his father had done. When God sent him out of the, had him out of the garden, he says, you're going to be a tiller of the ground. Scum scholars argue that there was a rivalry here between the two different ways of living, pastoral and agricultural. Well, such a view is read into the story. And one must not see conflict unless one can find it in the text. <clears throat> it is likely that both learned their occupations from Adam, their father. We know Adam was a tiller of the ground because it's, God tells him that's what he's going to be doing toward the end of chapter 3. <clears throat> the population of the earth consisted only of the family of Adam and Eve at this time. And a division of labor among the sons makes sense and reveals no disharmony. We should not find disharmony when none is stated. <clears throat> the farmer and the sheep herder could trade with each other to provide each family's needs. Okay, the division of labor just makes economic sense. It's a good idea. The tillers of the ground could provide grain and vegetables, while the sheep herder could provide milk, yogurt, cheese, and perhaps leather. Together, the two sons could make a well-rounded diet. Whether they ate meat at this time seems doubtful based on the permission given to Noah in 9.3. There's a lot of people who believe they were eating meat and that 9.3 is a confirmation of that. I don't accept that view. But he clearly, he's keeping sheep and goats very early. He's a sheep herder. Now, if you know anything about goats and I don't know much about sheep milk, but I know goat milk is very good, and you can make yogurt and cheese. <clears throat> it is noteworthy that the two sons of the first couple are observed in callings that involved diligent labor. Adam worked and cared for the garden in paradise, and his firstborn son, was a gardener, a tiller of the ground, a farmer. <clears throat> In naming the animals, Adam learned the nature of various beasts and likely taught his second son about goats and sheep. There are some animals that are easy to train. They dwell well with man, and there are other animals that do not. The biblical account reveals the first family is intelligent and immediately involved in dominion work necessary for civilization. The evolutionist presupposes, if you go to college, you'll learn this garbage. The evolutionist presupposes that our ancestors were primitive hunter-gatherers who lived in a state of poverty due to stupidity. Okay, they would live in caves, and they would go out, and they would catch what they could, and they were basically nomads who wandered the land, killing what they could. The Bible presents man as immediately engaged in developed, settled labors. Completely different than what is taught in colleges and universities today. The scriptures give us a true picture of man, while the evolutionist bases his theories on looking at wicked, degenerate, savage cultures today. The nomadic hunter-gatherers in Africa, for example. They look at what's going on among primitive peoples today, and then they read that back into history, 
in their evolutionary theories. People who are hunter-gatherers today who live in dire poverty uh, are degenerates from civilization. That's not how man started out. That's what man degenerated into because of the fall. Well, let's look at scene one, the two offerings. <clears throat> the first scene opens with the first two brothers in history at worship. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of the flock and their fat. That's verse 3 and 4a. Well, there are a number of significant things about this scene. First, note that a specific time of worship is mentioned. <clears throat> the phrase of the process of time in Hebrew is literally after the end of days. After the end of days. Now, the expression is vague and could be interpreted in two different ways and generally has been. One view is that it signifies the end of the week of the Sabbath day. You can see that the Puritans like this view. We know from other portions of Scripture that the Sabbath day, the seventh day during the Old Covenant era, <clears throat> the first day, the resurrection day in the New Covenant era, is the weekly appointed time of rest and worship. And that's a distinct possibility. Another view is that an indifferent period of days is used because there was a this is a special time of worship at the close of the agricultural year. In favor of this year are the following observations. Number one, if the Sabbath day was in view, why not be more specific? Why not just say the seventh day or the Sabbath day? Number two, the fact that Abel brings the firstlings of his livestock, that is the firstborn animals, and Abel brings some of his produce probably indicates that this was a time of special thanksgiving at the end of the agricultural season. Okay, that's a possibility. While the latter interpretation makes more sense, one could uh, assume, based on the analogy of Scripture, that this did occur on the Sabbath, after the harvest. The point of this story is not the point prove that, uh, that there is a special appointed time for worship that's an inference, but that's not the main point of the story. Nevertheless, given the doctrine of sola scriptura, sola scriptura, one could assume that both brothers were following some form of direct revelation regarding the time. It is obviously not a coincidence that they were making their offerings at the same time of year. Okay, they're both bringing an offering. Second, it is also noteworthy that they brought their offerings to the Lord at a particular place. This is very interesting. Cain brought produce, and Abel brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. Abel brought a burnt offering, which suggests an altar upon which the innocent victim would be slain or its blood poured out and the fatty portions burned. Now, it could have just been a rock. It could have been a, a stack of rocks. We don't know. While it is not the purpose of the story to focus our attention on a precise place of sacrifice, it nevertheless does imply a special place where sacrifices were offered unto the Lord. That God's special presence was to be found at this place of worship is suggested by the language of verse 16 at the end of the narrative. Listen to this. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, although we are not told where the sacrifice, sac sacrificial area was, the last verse of chapter 3 would likely be viewed by the Jews of this narrative. Uh, yet the last verse of chapter 3, uh, who read this narrative as implying that God's special presence was to be found at the gate or eastern border of the Garden of Eden. Now listen to me. Listen to this. This is Genesis 3.24. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword, literally a, uh, which turned every way, it's a, a sword that could spin around, 
to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, the cherubim were mighty angels described in a number of ways in Scripture. Some have two wings, 1 Kings 6.24, others four, Ezekiel 1, 6, and 11. And, of course, the ones that were above the mercy seat. Now, what is significant is that they are specifically presented in Scripture as those angels who attend upon the presence of God. Jehovah is characterized as the one who is enthroned, Hebrew, sits on the cherubim. 1 Samuel 4, 4, 2 Samuel 6, 2, 2 Kings 19, 15, 1 Chronicles 13, 6, Psalm 81, 80, verse 1, 99, verse 1, Isaiah 37, 16, etc. And you can read in the Old Testament about God's cherubim chariot. God is repeatedly represented as dwelling above the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus 25, 22, and number 7, 89, etc. <coughs> the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle and temple were all decorated with cherubim to indicate God's special presence at the place of worship. Now, in the passage before us, the cherubim were stationed, or literally in Hebrew, were uh, caused to camp at the east gate or entrance of Eden. Now, note that the Garden of Eden had only one entrance, and this entrance was on the east side. And this is exactly the same as the tabernacle and temple, where you entered on the eastern side. The cultic overtones of the cherubim, they're being caused to camp, and the location of the gate on the east side of the garden are unmistakable. It seems that while man was barred from paradise in the tree of life, Jehovah instituted animal sacrifices in order to maintain a relationship with Adam and Eve. And we'll go into this, how we have evidence of this later. They could not enter the garden. They could not come near the tree of life, but they could <coughs> approach God near the gate of the garden through the shed blood of clean animals. The last verse of chapter 3 contains a number of powerful symbols that interpreted in light of later sanctuary temple design teach us that the Garden of Eden was a kind of archetypical sanctuary where God was uniquely present in all his blessedness and life-giving power. Because of the fall, Adam and Eve were forced to leave the garden. But now God, in his love, grace, and mercy, came out of the garden to meet with the fallen couple near the gate, to fellowship with them through the mediator, symbolizing the bloody death of a clean animal. Although the first sin was wicked and a complete disaster for our first parents, God reached out to them with a saving grace. All of this reminds us that while we can never do anything to achieve heaven or enter paradise, Jesus came down out of heaven to save and reward us, excuse me, to save and redeem us and rescue us from our own sin, wickedness, and stupidity. Christ suffered for us outside the gate so that the veil of the Holy of Holies could be torn wide open so that we could have eternal life and access to God. So based upon the symbolism, the location, I think there's very good evidence that God came to meet them right outside the gate and they would approach under the gate where the cherubim was, were, excuse me. Now, we're going to stop here, and we're going to come back in a little bit and look at the rest of this, and we haven't even got to the real crucial part yet. This is basically introduction to this, the main part of the story. <clears throat> we're going to see that at this very early date, the first family, God provides for them a biblical method of approaching him in redemption, the typology that looks to Jesus Christ, and God provides for them instituted worship, biblical worship. These things are crucial. And we'll see this when we come back in a little bit. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this amazing section of Scripture. It is rich. It is profound. We ask, Lord, that you would ingrain it into our minds and hearts, that we would remember it, that we would learn from it, that we would study it and apply it to our lives, that we would not partake of the sin of Cain, but that we would follow the godly example of Abel, who had faith in Jesus Christ through the slain sacrifice. We thank you for this word. In Jesus' name, amen.